So I'm the Business Development Officer at CIRM. Um, for those of you who don't know CIRM, we're the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, we were established in 2004 with the passage of Proposition 71 with $3 billion of funding from taxpayers of California. Uh, we've deployed roughly $2 billion to date, so we roughly have uh, $1 billion left, uh, which we believe will take us through about 2020. Um, we are exciting, uh, excited that we've just rolled out what we're calling CIRM 2.0, which is a total revamp of our funding. Uh, we've significantly reduced the cycle from when someone applies to CIRM to actually receiving funding. Uh, historically, that has taken anywhere up to 22 months. Uh, we've reduced that down to 120 days, uh, so about a four-month period of time to actually apply to CIRM to receiving funding. Um, we have also uh, are now accepting applications on a rolling basis. So every month you're able to apply to CIRM for funding, which is uh, a significant change from how we had operated historically. Uh, so we're very excited about that. We've rolled this out to clinical stage programs and late preclinical stage programs. Uh, we plan to roll that out to basic biology and tools and technology awards later this year as well. Um, so with that, um, you know, CIRM is, is obviously a funder of, of novel stem cell technologies. Um, and so we think that CIRM 2.0 will be a, a great way to attract academic researchers as well as companies who are working in the translational space. Uh, so with that, uh, let me turn over to our panelists. I'll start with Lisa for a brief introduction. I'll get the microphone so you can hear me. Good morning. My name is Lisa Rose. I'm a managing director at Easton Capital. Easton is uh, focused in on truly only innovative products. So the panel couldn't be more appropriate for us because we actually don't invest in things that are need to or slightly incrementally better. We don't believe that that's worth the investment and the time to to focus in on that. So um, what we do is we invest across the uh, across the stage in life sciences, therapeutics, uh, uh, medical devices, healthcare technology, and diagnostics when that when that's appropriate. That probably is the least part of our portfolio. Um, as this one is much more focused in on the therapeutic side, I'll give a little bit of background on what I've done. Prior to being at Easton, I was with a venture uh, private equity fund that was focused in on developing the later stage, and what they called later stage was phase one, phase two assets where we actually took them in-house and did a development of them as opposed to having the companies do that. So I actually ran that organization as well as their intellectual property. Um, within Easton, I actually look at the I look at all opportunities. Within our portfolio on the therapeutic side, we will be looking, we look at things that are truly innovative across our portfolio since 1999 when we were established, we'll look at things that are truly disruptive and we've been probably one of the earlier stage investors in each of those new innovative areas um, in, in the spectrum from uh, gene therapy to medical stents with the first um, Connor med systems with the first medicated stents, etc. So we do look at very th things that are very, very innovative and look forward to discussing that further. <coughs> Thank you, Lisa. Uh, my name is Daniel Amani. I'm a partner with Strong Kernel Life Sciences. Uh, we're a life science venture capital fund uh, headquartered in Dublin, Ireland. We're a pan-European fund. We invest in Ireland, UK, mainland Europe. We've also been very active by creating the best of medtech innovation from the US into Ireland, <coughs> leveraging a very strong medtech cluster which exists in the Galway area. So we've done that with a technology that was initially developed at Emory University. We spun that out in November 2010 headquartered in Ireland, had a prototype stage, brought it through CMR, early commercialization. That company was, was acquired by Tortec back in July last year. As a fund, we're kind of 50-50 split between therapeutics and medical devices. Uh, like Lisa, we invest in innovation, we invest in people, we like assets which are first in class and best in class product opportunities, which can either create new markets or which can disrupt new markets. And look forward to interacting with, with, the, with, the, with the audience today as well. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Dibbs. I'm a scientist by training, and I've been at New Leaf for about six years. Uh, prior to that, I was at the Boston Consulting Group. I was a principal in the biopharma practice. Uh, New Leaf is a healthcare-focused venture fund. Uh, within healthcare, the majority of our investing is on the therapeutic side. Uh, we also do medical devices, uh, healthcare IT, and diagnostics. I spend all my time on the therapeutic side. And within therapeutics, we really do a broad range. We do everything from early stage startups, university spinouts, all the way through public stuff, public markets. We have a separate fund that's dedicated to the public market um, investing. And I spend about 75% of my time on the private side and 25 on the public. And when we're investing in technology, whether it's a, you know, whether it's a phase two or phase three asset or it's an early stage spinout, we're always looking for things which can, which are, as you said, not incremental, which can, which have a change, which change the practice of medicine and really provide a address and clear on that. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, so I'm Sam Hall with Apple Tree Partners. Um, I guess I hope nobody has a Me Too project. We can't talk about it. Um, so Apple Tree has a $1.5 billion healthcare focused uh, venture fund, um, relatively new and closed in, in December 2012, and um, uh, not too dissimilar to New Leaf. I think we, we have a lot of activities across a number of areas, including public and private, um, early and late stage. Uh, the majority of the fund is therapeutics, which is where I spend 100% of my time. I'm uh, responsible for kind of the kiddie pool, so largely academic spin outs, um, uh, largely clinical, but um, in contrast to many venture groups, Apple Tree has a, has a really very long term uh, investment horizon and uh, is not structured as a traditional 10 year fund. Um, so, so we're able to get involved early and take projects um, all the way through concept and beyond um, without really a sort of laser focus on an exit, but rather focus on creating uh, optimal value in those programs and in companies. Um, and in many cases, we would actually uh, develop a company all the way through uh, to becoming a commercial entity, and we're doing that with um, one of our portfolio companies called Braver and Pharmaceutical, which is an uh, opiate addiction company. Um, so for the earlier stage portfolio that, that I spend my time on, the hope is that some of those will mature to become uh, real operating entities uh, that we support all the way um, as, as a major important investor. Um, and for some of them, we'll act like a normal uh, venture group and, um, and we'll consider transactions with, with larger pharmaceutical suppliers and stuff. Um, but uh, it's an interesting group, and so thanks for being Great, thanks everyone. So just to set the context of, of our discussion, so I want to talk a little bit about how um, investors think about analyzing the uh, potential investment, uh, what types of things they, they look for, and then actually once that investor is made, how do you manage that investment for success? Um, so the one thing, Daniel, I'd love to get your perspective on as you're evaluating no novel technologies um, between Europe and the US, do you look at them differently? Does reimbursement come into play as you're thinking about making an early stage investment, or is that something that doesn't come till later down the road? I, I suppose to the earlier stage technologies, I mean, certainly on the medical device side, there is a difference between Europe and the USA. Europe is more fragmented, um, and different countries have different processes. Uh, but typically, the reimbursement is, for the earlier stage technologies, reimbursement is not something that we, I suppose, worry a lot about, because if you're investing in innovation and investing in first-class products, then there's probably not a reimbursement quote out there already, so you're you're looking for you know, to uh, adapt to follow the technology once it's it's going through clinical development and gets approval. Um, you know, medicine is practiced differently in Europe versus the USA, and there are some applications which we'll find in Europe less so on the US and vice versa. So we do certainly tend to take a global view um, and try to you know get get feedback from key leaders. Uh, both on the European and on the US side as we look at any particular opportunity. So reimbursement for early stage, we're probably not as concerned about, uh, but certainly medical practice is different in different jurisdictions, so one has to take it into consideration, absolutely. Mm -hmm. How about any others on the panel? Is reimbursement a major consideration when you're looking at making an initial investment, or is that something that you kind of save for, for a later date? Actually, reimbursement is probably in the top areas of due diligence, um, especially when you look at medical devices. The regulatory pathway differs um, for each type, each class of medical device, and you have to be certain about what kind of regulatory pathway you have, what the reimbursement opportunities are. When we look at something, especially on the innovative side, you're trying to understand, first of all, what that regulatory pathway is, what the potential is for reimbursement, and globally, to say that just because you get a regulatory in a country such as CE market across Europe, that's not necessarily sufficient data to secure reimbursement. You have to go on a country by country basis, nor does that ensure that you have data for marketing. So that reimbursement component is critical. And uh, one, of, one of our companies right now that is truly innovative and disruptive, they have taken an enormous initiative and have focused in from the CE mark approval into prior to their FDA approval to really focus in on ensuring that they have reimbursement within Germany and the UK as the first areas of opening the doors on a commercial basis. And I think that's an important point. I think it's important to keep in mind when you're designing early stage clinical trials, phase one and phase two, what do you need to do and what do you need to demonstrate to secure reimbursement down the road? And so if, you're, if you leave that to phase three, you're probably sort of behind the ball when you're thinking about how to position your product for commercial success. 
Um, so, so Sam, let me let me ask you. Um, you know, everyone on this panel is, is focused on innovative, disruptive technologies. What types of things do you look for uh, in, an, in an investment opportunity? You're looking for for paradigm shifting types of technologies. Are you looking for mechanistic data? Are you looking for proof of concept and animal models? What types of things sort of really spark your interest? Yeah, uh, I mean, the products that tend to get the greatest traction with us. Um, are those, as you, I actually think the commitment that you heard across the entire panel to innovation is one way of combating the reimbursement concerns that alluded to because, you know, novel delivery is great, but that's, it's got to meaningfully change clinical care in order for that to be very important, right? Um, so, so I think, so we try to be as innovative as possible, but a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities that really gain traction will take either uh, really well understood biology and then we'll layer on some chemical or modality risk to that. Um, um, but you know, often we're talking about a receptor where there's 20 years of, of knowledge and insight into how it affects disease and, and is relevant to pathophysiology. Or in another example of a company we've recently funded, uh, we've taken essentially chemical risk off the table by using um, uh, pretty well established and characterized antisense chemistries, um, but in a completely novel way, and there we have biological so often it's actually that combination. We really want something that's you know, elegant science that moves things forward, but um, but often a little bit of mitigation from having an aspect of it understood. Um, so I don't know if it's a partial answer, but those are. But we but echoing what's been said. I mean, really not me too. I mean, we, we really want to see something that is going to drive at the heart of the disease and that has biological data saying that for whatever the unique reason is, that's going to be. So I think I think that's a good point. I mean, we've heard a lot about not sort of the incremental benefits. We're really talking about sort of game-changing types of technology. So, Mike, well, why don't I ask you what what sorts of things are you looking for? Um, are you are you more interested in platform technologies? Are you more interested in, in single asset entities uh, that have that potential? Yeah, we do a, we do a mix of platform and of single asset companies. But I think one other piece that we look for, whether it's a platform or a single asset, is we look for very clear development paths. We want to be able to show that once we're in the it's an early stage asset, once we're in the clinic, we can prove that we're engaging the target. So there's a very good PD asset that's well established, and also that we can get some proof of concept in a relatively tractable number of patients. You have you have to do a form patient study just to see if your drug has some activity. That's not something that's a that's a good use of venture capital. So we're looking for indications where we can actually show that. We focus a lot. We're, we, will, we won't invest in areas where we can't do that. Um, in terms of platform versus single asset, we're comfortable doing both. I think if we're looking at a platform, what we'll look for is something where we are very excited about the lead asset and we would take that forward ourselves. And then we'd look for the rest of the platform to generate more assets we'd back or also be able to generate non-dilutive finance for the platform through partnerships. I think the value of the platform is that you can partner with someone else, a pharma company, you can bring in capital and also their knowledge and expertise. You can learn about your platform on somebody else's time. Um, so I guess that's a nice segue to um, one, one point that we talked about on, on the pre-call is, is sort of the, the build to buy model that we've seen emerge uh, in early stage investing. And, and what I mean by that is, is venture capital firms often partnering with large pharma uh, and the VC firms um, putting forth equity capital, uh, the pharma putting forth uh, milestone based payments uh, to reach some sort of crit critical value inflection point, whether that's an IND filing or the completion of a phase one trial, uh, with the option to buy the program uh, at the end of, of that data. data. And so there's a, there's a built-in return. Um, and so the upside is, is capped from the uh, ROI perspective. Uh, it's also capped for the entrepreneur, but it's, it's a nice built-in return. It could be two and a half, three times. Um, and so it's not ever going to be a home run, but it could be hitting a single or, or double for a lot of funds. So I'd, I'd be interested in your perspective on what you think about this sort of novel trend of uh, build and buy models that we've seen in recent years. Yeah, we, <coughs> yeah, we tend not to do them. I know there's a couple of venture firms that have been very successful in doing that. But I think one thing, you are capping your upside, and you don't know what the unicorns in your portfolio are. Alios was a you know, unprecedented exit for a number of firms, almost $2 billion. I don't think anyone could have predicted that three years ago and someone did an option deal, your 10, 20, 30x deal that happens you know, once every fund or two, you're going to lose that if you do a lot of these option deals. So that's why we just tend not to do them. But, but I think for, I suppose in our experience where you have a platform technology where there could be a myriad of product, different product applications, you know, we, we've certainly taken the view that you know, for early stage companies, you know, they don't have the bandwidth or the resources to maybe develop three or four or five different products in parallel. 
Whereas if you can take one particular product application, you can partner that with Pharma. They're putting in the, the R&D dollar, they're, they're supporting the FTE. Uh, you kind of <coughs> built in milestones in terms of as you reach, you know, kind of phase one or phase two uh, milestones and so forth. We certainly, in one case, we've done that type of option-based deal because it was the only way the company could uh, allow itself to develop, you know, more than two or three different products in parallel. So, for a platform, we would consider it if it's a single asset company, I think it become very difficult. Um, I just add in that there's sort of the two models on it. There's the putting the partnership up front, which is a, really a right of first refusal, which we don't do. We think that that caps you out, and it's actually very, very, um, it, it's, it's highly risky because you really don't know what's going to happen. But in terms of co-investing with strategic venture partners, there's a huge opportunity because they're around the table. You don't want to ever have, you want to have them as your partner. They provide incredible insight into how a large pharma perceives the investment, the package that they want, and then generally because they are really helpful around the table, they will give, gain access into their organization's resources. We find that that's a great value add, and those are things we, we highly recommend, and there's some great strategic venture groups out there right now, so we like that. We like to price it, and they like to be participating in it. So we've heard a little bit about um, what uh, what investors are looking for in terms of innovative types of technologies. Let me let me shift a little bit and ask you know who, who you think is appropriate for venture funding um, at certain stages. What what type of company profile you think is better suited to angels or non dilutive funding versus, versus venture funding? Um, obviously there there's a sort of a continuum of funding out there, and you know I would argue that it's shifted to the left in many respects. And we see we heard on the last panel that. A lot of pharma's investors are looking at much earlier stage investments than they had historically to help rebuild their, their pipeline. Um, and so, Lisa, why don't I start with you about the types of attributes of companies you're looking for? Yeah, so first of all, what, what you're doing is it depends on, on sort of the actual asset that you have in the innovation. So I'll give examples such as that, you know, I've done something that was preclinical, that was a new mechanism of action that was targeting the lupus category. It was just an idea, a concept, and it was a mechanism of action where there were two other groups where there were later stage. This one, though, had a, had a safety profile that was significantly superior, yet we knew it had that kind of that same efficacy profile because it was going after that same pathway. So for us, that was a really interesting opportunity. One was adventure ready. It was venture ready from day one. It was a, um, a an entrepreneur who had had success before in the past. He's a, he was a prior strategic um, investor in a large pharma company. He had excellence in clinical, uh, putting together a clinical trial. And the profile of what we needed in that organization was basically go out and deliver and put a package together. Other companies, what they really need to do is to have some kind of proof of concept in this innovation, whether it be, um, as, as Mike was saying, about some kind of validated um, thesis in science or a literature leap that says that from this, we're seeing something novel and new, but we'll look for things that are saying, I've done some kind of basic research on it, I have some kind of proof of efficacy, and then I have the structure that I understand that will get us to the next step that create value and reflection points. So we look for things that are strong management teams that understand what the science is, identify strong science, that have the infrastructure that is appropriately matched to meet the next milestone, have some kind of proof of efficacy, and then have a capital efficient model to go forward. Prior to that, that's really where the angels come in, and you don't really want to have the VCs around the table trying to say, gosh, you've got to get to that point. You're on this timeline. The clock is now ticking. Um, unfortunately, we don't have all the, the benefits of being that more of the open-ended fund, which I think is a, a much better approach, but at the end of the day, you are going to have to sort of you know, be focused in on that timeline. So that that's kind of what we're looking for. Sam, I'm going to ask you the same question. I know, you know, we've talked about that you guys are interested in spending out technology from academia. And so perhaps management team isn't sort of top of your list when you're looking at, at actually company formation and bringing in your own management team. So what, what are the sorts of criteria that you really focus on? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, frankly, we're really science and idea-led in, in what, um, and each project's different, but, um, you know, compelling projects are compelling projects. And I think um, there's been, one thing I see in sort of academia, um, sort of the, the ecosystem um, is is a little bit of a perception that, that you need to have quote a company before you can start to talk to investors. And 
we may be naive or silly because apple trees, you know, just taking shape and our portfolio is growing. But I actually, frankly, would rather um, get involved from the get-go around the idea and put together the right team. And it's a lot of work, but um, but uh, start from there um, as opposed to come in with um, with sort of a, no a nominal company, but it's not it's not necessarily the right the right setup to really take the idea forward. So so we really are led by the science, and as Lisa said, I think part by virtue of the fact that we have the luxury of, of not being on the clock. So um, you know, there are a number of examples where we've taken you know, really really cool ideas and put a um, million dollars at it to incubate it and uh, answer the right scientific questions, really prove it out, uh, generate the right business plan, start to recruit the right management. Um, and there are other groups that do, do pursue a similar approach to that, but we're very willing to do that. Um, you know, if, if the company's taking shape and the right team's there and everything, everything's ready for a real Series A of size, great. I and mean, that's that's great too. But um, but uh, we're almost agnostic. We just want to build it the right way. Okay, great. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit now and then talk about, you know, we've heard about how to sort of analyze a potential investment. How do you actually manage that investment for clinical success and, and you know, potential success with a partnership uh, or with a go it alone strategy? Um, and so, uh, Mike, maybe I, maybe I can ask you, um, do you have a good example of, of a of successful investment that you've made and how you've managed that investment for success, whether that's been a corporate partnership or an IPO or whatever that exit may have been? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're, a, we're a typical, we're a lead investor, we take a board seat, we take a very active role in the companies we invest in. I think it's it's very hard, in, and anyone who's saying they can control when they're going to exit is kind of is fooling themselves. I think ex exits are things that happen to companies who create value over time. So when we're on the board of a company, um, we're very focused on creating value and bringing the company to the next step. And part of that is doing a partnership, and part of it is, frankly, fundraising. So. And, and it's also making the right decisions, strategic decisions when you're at the board level. So um, this is not a company that's exited yet, but one of the companies on the board of is Principia, which is a company that we, it's a, it's a, it's a cap, chemistry platform company that we spun out of the university at uh, UCSF. And you know, they took their first, they had, a, they had a really interesting platform, they took their first lead product in the clinic, they didn't see what we thought we were gonna see, and the unit investors decided we need to double down and make sure that the backup goes into the clinic and that actually went into the clinic. We raised a good amount of money uh, at, actually before that. We actually saw activity from that, and that, that set the company up to do, you know, they just finished their phase one trial. But it was the, you know, we went out and made sure that the company was well-financed to get through the next inflection point. And, and they've actually, we have a second program that we actually decided not to partner because we wanted to actually push that forward ourselves to the point where we can actually create more value. So a lot of the option decisions about when you partner, how you partner, and how you raise capital is something that we're very focused at because the more options you have, the better you're going to be able to exit your companies. Sort of value versus risk sharing. And so I know at, at CERN, for instance, we have a portfolio of over 80 translational programs, um, nine of which are, are entering phase one clinical trials. We have one in phase two. Uh, we have many others that will be filing INDs over the next 12 to 24 months. And so, you know, I think CERN looks at things differently from an ROI perspective. You know, we are actively engaged with, with pharma, with investors, and really seeking to partner our programs early on. We're seeking not only co-funding for our programs, but also pharma and investor expertise to help shape and mold those programs to ultimately be successful. Um, you know, our primary goal is, is to deliver therapies to patients. You know, our mission is not really one of, of a return on investment. Now, we do have some, some revenue sharing provisions in place to return capital to the taxpayers, but that's not our primary motivation. So when you think about the right time to partner, um, it, it, is there a right time? Is it post phase one data? Is it post phase two data? How do you balance sort of the risk sharing versus you know, the value creation? I think it's a judgment call. Uh, I think it's case by case. Um, you know, if there's, uh, I suppose, uh, an opportunity on the table, um, you have to consider it and all, all its merits and, and all its warts as well, I guess. So certainly for us, it's, it's case by case in, in, each, in each situation. Um. You know, good, good assets aren't sold, they're bought. So you have to put yourself in a situation where you create value that someone is going to want to buy what you have. And, that's, and you know, as I said before, it's about creating optionality. If you have an asset, you're running out of money, you have your data, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to get a good exit at that point. So all you can really control in this business on the investor side is putting more money in. So we, our focus is funding companies through real inflection points, and then if we're, if the inflection, if the, if the trial hits, we get the milestone we want, we're actually excited to put more money in, or we're excited to raise more money. And then if good things, if, if good things happen, that's great. But 
you know, on the investor side, you can really only control when you put money in. I think if you have some, oh, sorry, good strategic planning, and I think that's the one thing I see often is the most missed um, opportunity within the earlier stage, especially on the therapeutic side. If you do that, you actually are creating opportunities. People will see what you're doing. It's, it is a commercial opportunity that's of high interest, and that you will have done all the right things to create the data sets that you need to create that value. So as an investor, yes, we can control how much money we put in, but you can really control the, the strategic value. And you know, having been in big pharma for quite a bit and doing a lot of that strategic work, if you do that stuff up front, then you're really creating a solid foundation for that optionality that Mike keeps on talking about. Plus, you're also creating as much of a strong foundation as you can to do that. And then, you know, when do you hold them? When do you when do you you know let them go? It, it comes down to what the best offers are. Many times, the stories around the table are, boy, if I had only sold then, that would have been the home run. Generally, it's your first offer. <laughs> so let me pause there. I don't I don't want to monopolize all the time uh, asking questions. I'm sure the audience members probably have far better questions than I do. So let me open it up and see if there are any questions from the audience. Yep. I guess what's the best way um, for somebody to connect with you? Um, is it here? Is it mostly through one of your partners? Is it a <coughs> um, What is the process uh, to get considered? I'll start. Um, the cold calling is really hard because, as you can imagine, we get multiple business, business uh, um, in investor submissions. Um, it's an introduction through someone. Um, and then a real strong rationale for that. So somehow if you can connect with someone that you've met at a conference somehow, or there's an introduction, that makes a big, big difference. And when you go in there, just really clearly set out you know, a few key things. What's your innovation? What's the market opportunity? Stage of development, because you never get that, and any of that, and what your capital needs are. Not that it's the best thing since the world has gone on, but just those very few things very, very simply like You know, I think far from I think the worst place to connect is at JP Morgan. I mean, I think all of you, <laughs> like us, have back to back to back meetings. Um, so we do we do very few new company meetings at JP Morgan because we would like to remember the meetings we have with people. Um, so you know, here we really meet with people that we're following up with, we have relationships with, we're following stories. Um, and I mean, we actually I think for me, cold emails are fine. I get a lot of emails from people who are friends of friends or referred to us or look at our website and know what I'm doing. You know, if you send me an email on the slide deck, you know, we can triage it internally, and if I'm not the right person I to talk to, I can send you to the right person, and we can give you feedback, and if necessary, set up a meeting. And if you have an introduction, that's even better. I mean, a lot of our deals come in through other investors or former CEOs, so, but I think either way, email is, and, and you know, our presentation is pretty efficient. Yeah, we, we, we try to respond to everything, too. Um, sometimes fail, because there are a lot, but, um, but I echo it. Intros are helpful. I, I know just from from some standpoint. I mean, intros are great, uh, but you know, I, I, I we always take uh, emails from people who've looked at our website or interested in our programs. Um, so everything that we have is up on our website. So I'd encourage everyone to take a look at our site, look at our recent program announcements under CERM 2.0, uh, and then I would highly encourage you to reach out to myself or others at CERM uh, to, to vet your programs before you actually go through with applying to a grant. We can more than happy to give you feedback on on the program and you know if it's uh, if it's potentially a fundable proposition under our, our, our funding mandate. Uh, so any any additional questions? Yes, uh, in the back. Sure, thanks so much. Um, so one of the questions we've got really is about the probability of funding, right? There are different ways of assessing the risk of a particular opportunity. So in the space where it's innovation is the key driver, obviously there's inherent risk, right? So just curious, if I was come in or find a company and funding, take for phase one asset, no, how would you how do you go about actually deciding the possibility? Do you look at it Do you guys do it differently? For different models or is it not important when it's in relation? Well, I, I would just say the first thing is is that if it's not innovation, when you say the traditional programs, that's the highest risk because there's not going to be a sale, there's not going to be reimbursement, and the, the, the current market does not accept it. So innovation, I think, is a baseline. When, I, when you look at innovation, it really is a combination of, of sort of statistics and, and your gut feel. Um, and if you don't have the gut feel on this, you don't know. Because of the fact that we see so many different things across the market, things that are truly disruptive really sort of stand out, and they have, you have to first say, Ah, does that work? That's the technical side of it. Is it possible to work? 
and then you, you assign in your, your mind the internal probability of that, then if it does work, can I, can I do I have a regulatory pathway that will, will get me there? And then that's the, the, the pathway that you really focus in on. And then what is the commercial market opportunity? Um, and that commercial market opportunity, I think, is one of the biggest areas that you have to focus in on, at least that's what we look at. And then, will that team be able to deliver upon it? Because I fundamentally believe, and I've seen having run development programs, enormous risk in making a mistake, especially on the biologics and the CMC side. One mistake sets you back four years, and that is a risk that you don't want to take. So that's how I would assess something, um, so commercial probability, can you make it? Is it? Is it? Is it a? Can, can it, is, does it? Is it a probability that technically it's going to work? <coughs> the regulatory pathway, and then the development the team to develop it. Yeah, let, me, yeah, let me just jump in here for a second. I, you know, I also think first thing you want to have. If it's not first in class or best in class, you know, you're not going to have that upside potential of that sale. But I do think you know we look at we do look at the technical aspects of the program. We think about probability success. One of my former clients, a pharma company, they did an analysis of their pipeline. Um, and looked at failure. And if they looked at phase one assets that did that were novel mechanisms of action that had no PD market and target engagement, zero. So that's pretty easy probability of success, and we wouldn't do that kind of deal. So if it's a phase one asset, we want to see that the target has some validation. The best kind of validation is in in people. So if there's genetic, even if, it, if if there's genetic data, in that's one validation to look for. And then we want to have an assay that we can show that you're actually engaging the target in phase one. And then you have a and then safety obviously in, in phase one. But those are the things we look for. And you know, there's, there's historical data across there if you're curious. Right, so you prioritize those types of opportunities Right, I mean, we, can, we can deploy our capital anywhere, so we're gonna look for assets like that. So one thing that I, I just wanna add from, from CERN's perspective is, you know, we look for programs where we can help increase the probability of success. And so we really try to partner with programs, and so uh, we, we try to bring uh, to that program our, our um, basically our capabilities, our external network of experts, our internal staff uh, to help partner with the programs, to help shape them for success and really increase the probability of those programs being successful.